was that? That was Ben. He's the man. Yes, he's our painter. So you also did a lot of the landscaping you see around here. Oh, this right here? Yep. Those look like traps. they're dying. They they do appear to be dying, but <laughs> they're living annual plants. They'll replenish themselves. Oh, okay. when they come I back. hope he's a better painter than me as well. He better be. Um, I went to Detroit on Sunday and I thought saw Third Man Records. Have you been there? I have some good stories about Third Man, and yes. Yeah? Mm-hmm. What's good story? Well, I want to hear your story first. What did you think about their I, I, It was pretty cool. Like, got to see, we didn't get to see the tour, but we saw, like, inside. And they've got a stage where they do shows and stuff. That being said, I will say it matches your car perfectly, third man. Yeah, right. it Couldn't be any better for the Fiat. I, I know. I, that is very true. We should do, like, a gelato event with them or something. You should. But what's amazing, what Jack built over there, so at Leon, we just had what's called the VIP Summit, which we brought in all of our best dealers from all over the world to Leon. Oh, cool. You know, about 50 over the last two or three weeks. And we scheduled tours of their factory. Ah, oh, so you brought your dealers down to Third Man. Yes. So they started at Leon to see, you know, how we make the speakers, mm. how we make turntables. Then uh -huh. we brought them down to Third Man, and we were on, I think, the third or fourth tour ever given by a very tall man named Jamie. With, I have a like, a big him. guy with, like, long hair? Yes, yeah, that's he Jamie. Was there. He's he the was man. There. He's a great guy. He knew a lot about making uh, actually, vinyl. Actually, I'm going to show, I'll show you a picture if I can find yes. it. Yes. Like, me standing next to this man was hysterical. <laughs> Uh, I really thought it was amazing. Like, we were like, what's that movie with Danny DeVito twins? Yes, we are complete <laughs> twins. I, he was so good at projecting his voice, which is something I struggled with. I had to have like a little microphone on my tours because, oh really? You know, I'm not I'm not six foot eight. Ah uh, yeah. Um, so it didn't pan out. But I'm gonna see if I can find you this picture and show it show it to the camera. What is? What if you just like carried a stool and so every I time you had to project, I, I, I you just like put your little stool down. <laughs> The dangerous thing about carrying a microphone on your hip is that you do feel a certain sense of power and then you start to have to really watch your words. Yeah. Um, and people around you, especially the factory workers, are not super stoked that you're going around sort of showing them in their native habitats. <laughs> so, uh, They're like, shoot, I didn't wash my hair this I, morning. Well, we tried to make it all show ready for them. But uh, Jack, because he was a furniture builder and a super creative artist, uh, rock, probably, you know, consider him like a last standing real rock stars yeah but um i don't know if you got to see the little back room where they mix all the live recordings but they have literally a stage to needle yeah we saw yeah. that that is so cool just the ultimate vision for us is to you know go from live performance all the way to playback the whole signal path well and if you think about if i'm a if I'm a musician and I'm gonna do like a Michigan tour, like I wanna do a show at Third Man and a show me and Oh my gosh, that's the guy. This is can the we guy. show the camera? I don't know if you can see a camera, but well, like a little closer. Yeah, there's you a can kinda see him. Yeah, he's great. There he is, he's good. Hey, but Jamie. notice, I mean, I'm gigantic and he's bigger than me. Yeah. I mean, as you can tell from how much room I take up with this Fiat. Yeah, I mean, you take up a lot of space. <laughs> yeah, and he yeah. takes up a lot more space. <laughs> I remember, still one of my fondest memories, Leon memories, besides the recorder sessions we had at Oh, RPM, we had amazing. Is the Guster tour. Yes. When we, like, I just remember being like, I just did a tour of Leon with, with Guster. Guster. <laughs> wearing, like, safety goggles. Oh, my. My favorite tour of Leon was possibly with my Michael Franti from um, and Michael Franti did the tour barefoot what yeah is that like tour. health safe or? you know I wouldn't say oh should be super yeah. stoked about it but I said for him I'm just gonna overlook that why was there a reason that he wanted to do it barefoot he was just feeling the spirit and I said you know what it's gonna be fun Leon's you know lab clean more spiritual it's <laughs> very spiritual and he's fine with it oh, but uh, my yeah gosh. he's used to walk in the, the bare earth so I thought it was good yeah, I just feel like I the mean, Guster I tour on, though was exceptional. That, Those guys were amazing. They were awesome. I remember they're like, "Can we get a ride at the Michigan Theater?" Because I had <laughs> this truck, right? And it was raining, and a, and they're like, "Do you have a cover for yes. that?" And it's like, "No." And like, "Okay, we'll like get an Uber." And I just thought, "Why are these rock stars not having transportation to their show?" <laughs> but you you provided for them there. That's right. Almost, the almost. They almost popped in your truck. I told you how when they came to San Francisco, Adam got me tickets. I didn't know that. Yeah, he. I emailed him because he gave me his card. I can't remember. He's such a good guy. And he was like, "Yeah, come to the show when we're in San Francisco." And so I emailed him when I heard they were coming, and uh, he got us 
tickets and we were able to see him like backstage afterwards. And I brought this guy that I was dating at the time who was had been a musician, so he was like You got the ends. I was like the coolest you got the ever. Rap shit. <laughs> that's <laughs> right, that's right. But they were now so good. Like yeah. I want them to go and tour again. They're so, so good live. They're so good live and going back to the village days, you know, um, when we used to because you're moving to New yeah. York City, I know. Right to the heart of the village, right? Yeah, where are the best venues? Like, where? Well, it's much different now. Yeah. So, but we used to play around there at a place called the Wetlands. The Wetlands? Where we used to actually play with Guster and bands like, you know, hippie, hippie start the jam what? bands in the early days. Yeah. And Guster used to come here and play at the Blind Pig, too. But they actually stuck with the pathway. Now the Wetlands is closed, but that's where I started, you know, really digging into music and doing some of our first live art performances. Ethan was the band leader of the Distill. What? And we used to drive from Michigan all the way to the wetlands after we left New York. And we would go back and forth playing the wetlands. Oh my gosh. It's sick venue. Do you ever wonder what would have happened if you like kept, if you never started Leon and you just, like kept doing music? I think at this stage of life, I think about that a lot. Yeah? Definitely, definitely, you know, uh, grounding oh, okay. yourself with a business. Hey, that was a yellow field. Yeah. What are the chances? I, I've, I've, never never seen I've never seen another yeah. yeah. Do I get to punch you? No, punch my butt. Oh, oh man. I don't know. But the uh, the thought comes up a lot because I remember all my friends who were turning into touring musicians and seeing their lifestyles. It's definitely not super family conducive, but also not conducive to starting a manufacturing business. Yeah. Which is something I don't think we ever really planned on doing. Right, because that wasn't something you were like, someday I'm going to start a manufacturing business. Never thought of that. <laughs> like, what, like, how did that even, when it came your way, what switched for you? Why were you like, yeah, I'm going to do this, when it was something that wasn't even on your radar before? Yeah. I think that at a certain time I realized, I started, I used to play and write a ton of music, and I love playing and writing music, but I also realized I love just the whole hustle, the whole game. I liked making the t-shirts and the posters and making the stuff that you that goes along, you know, all the merchandise that went with the bands. I realized I was obsessed with that as much as I was with writing and playing music. Mm. And then I started switching to doing live performance art, did that at the Wetlands um, and all over New York City. And I realized that my key job was actually just going forward, pushing whatever we were doing. So we started a business called Focus Records, and that was really merchandise, the fact that you could sell CDs. What are CDs? I don't remember. I don't, they're like these silver, I don't remember exactly. Oh, like vinyl, yeah. but smaller. Yeah, like that. <laughs> but it's like a needle was a laser. Oh, uh, um, yeah. Laser, wow. laser needles. Because lasers are like futuristic. Lasers, yeah. they came and went quickly. Laser discs, never caught on. Jamie at Third Man said that more vinyl is being sold than CDs now. That's good because vinyl looks cooler yeah and it sounds better it definitely sounds better and it's definitely why i used to go to the village as a kid was to go and collect back then dub reggae and like early stuff like uh by the beastie boys and mm. tribe Cold quest down soul all the sick hip-hop artists that came out saying heavy d special that i mean it was an incredible era for music out of there and we would go by 45s and vinyl and i had the worst system i don't even remember where everything was played definitely had a record player. I mean, it's kind of full circle, like you're yeah. now making this, the, you said you make turntables too? Well, yeah. my friend's making turntables, but to answer in a very long-winded way, um, getting back to how we got to speakers, we realized it's just anything we wanted to do, things weren't being made the same, the, 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 we didn't think it was super interesting, how things were being made. So the speakers you could buy at that time were really just black box, kind of boring stuff from Circuit City or uh, Circuit City, which is no longer in business. No longer in business. Um, guitars, it was just lo-fi, just not interesting. No natural materials. A lot of it was being, being made overseas. So we started just getting obsessed with recording music and playing it back. So we started making studio monitors. So it wasn't like we were planning to start a company from there. Um, tried making guitars because we thought that would be fun at that time. You need something to do during the day when you're playing music at night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you don't sleep? <laughs> no. I mean, you can't just laze around all day. So I would do the art all day, you know, paint and draw, do commission art, write songs. I had such a great 
early life routine after that. Everyone went to college and got real jobs in New York City. Uh, Me, I got a job cleaning floors at a bar at like 4 a.m. to get cash in my pocket, go home, sit on my stoop, uh, write songs for like three or four hours, then do artwork for probably 10 hours, meet up with the band. We had three houses in Ann Arbor where we just had all the musicians and engineers and craftsmen and freaks. So you were doing that in Ann Arbor and, you, and then it's up to you would drive to the show. So yeah, Ann Arbor was popping back then. You had at least two or three music venues you could play. Mm -hmm. One was the Blind Pig. Something. Which was good, where I met the Guster guys. Oh, really? Yeah. And then um, one was called Gypsy Cafe, which was a little coffee house kind of deal. And even if you started doing well and you started drawing a big crowd, you could play the Ark. Mm. Which we did. Our last show was at the Ark with the band called The Still. That's very cool. Yeah. What a way to go out. Yeah, but I think the speaker thing came was always about just making art and music. And we came up with some speaker things that caught on. But didn't plan on that. It's just like if a song catches on, you're gonna have to play that song forever. Another thing I didn't realize about music. <laughs> One of those like catchy songs. Catchy songs, you gotta play it. Well there's that, always that tension right between art and profit where like the song that on the art piece it's like most profitable it's all right, great. I have to do, I have to do some of the money now because this is what everyone wants versus what my artistic interests are taking me towards. That's a good point. I also think that the speakers became the fuel that fueled the grand fire, which was always about creating stuff, you know, making things, especially making things that have to do with art and audio, you know. So, so that was speakers, it might have been guitars, drums. We played making a lot of different stuff and then painting. You know, and drawing and making sunscreens and all the merchandise and the shirts and the fashion, the fabrics and all those things that I got obsessed with. And then I realized I just get obsessed with making things. <laughs> and so now, you know, that's why I'm starting with the spirits and the beer. Yeah, the fortune cookies. Fortune cookies. Uh, strange sundries. I don't really care as long as we're making it and uh, making it right. And are you, are you, you're doing, you've always done custom made speakers? Yeah. Or like Cust the speaker that caught on was a, was kind of strange because it was a speaker that was built to match a flat panel TV. Uh, that was a big revolutionary thing to build at that time because flat panel TVs were just coming out. And we first started making flat speakers that you could hang on the wall that look like art. And that was like our complete that's mixture. So cool. Yeah, that was our thing. And we we brought that to New York City to see if it would catch on and it just didn't mm. catch on. Why not? We had a pivot. I'll use a modern word. Oh we pivoted. <laughs> pivoted before <laughs> pivoting was cool. We pivoted first. The internet <laughs> companies, like, we were pivoting way before them. And, uh, yeah, we literally pivoted and uh, just started building what people were asking for, which back then was just speakers to match their TVs. We had already developed the thin speakers that hang on the wall. Mm -hmm. So it's strange. You know, we created an object that was in our genre of art and audio, you know, an exact mix of the two. And it sort of lent itself to oh, a different kind of art and audio, which is, hey, this is about interior design now. And so speakers mm. that people could not know that they owned, so they looked like they were part of the TV. And that's what caught on in New York City. Oh. And that's when we realized that that little wood shop that we had had to become a factory. And then that factory started building speakers that matched TVs. And then we started working for big companies like Morantz and Fujitsu and Pioneer and building speakers for their TVs for the dealers who were selling them in mostly in New York City and Florida and California at the time. Have and you ever had a moment where you're like, like someone approached you to build a speaker and you're like, kind of like one of those celebrity moments where you're like, oh my God, like I can't believe that I'm building a speaker for this company or this person. Oh man, I have so many. I don't know if I'm allowed to, to say no. the names of, I know who I am allowed to say the names of. Recently, we just had an amazing experience building speakers for Mike Gordon from Fish. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I just went yeah. to my first Fish concert in Austin, and I now know why they call the band Fish. Don't tell me. Because when when you're there, like everyone, it feels like everyone's on a fish in tank. A fish you're ball. just like kind of flowing. And <laughs> did they like have all their props along. coming over? Like, did they have all their props coming from overhead? Because if you go to their big live shows, um, they do insane set design, 
and sometimes they'll have giant, you know, floating hamburgers and hot dogs or things coming from overhead. Yeah, they did have like inflatables, but inflatables. they were coming from the stage, not from overhead because we were outdoors, like this amphitheater. What did you think your first fish show? It was pretty awesome, and I bet he has got great speakers now. <laughs> well, he was a great customer, um, and also I had one of my earliest memories was the first time I went to see fish was at the Orange County Fair in upstate New York and we heard about this band fish that was catching on sick little jam band oh my gosh and we went to see them and Mike Gordon was there and he's into film and other arts also and he was out there filming with his camcorder at that time uh, just filming the scene at the Orange County Fair and he was wearing a black jumpsuit with an orange stripe full-scale jumpsuit oh my god so I was immediately interested like who's this guy filming everything and they're like oh that's the bass player from fish so we talked to him for a second, talked about who else he had, which is Paige and Trey and Fishman, the people on stage. You know, that the band is just held up. Yeah. I... Gigantic live shows, though. Even then, it was the same sick live show. I mean, all in kind of band. Best time. And so, yeah, 20 years later, building speakers for him. And they're still perfect. and they're still performing. They're still touring. Oh, they sell out every, they it's sell amazing. Out every show. I can't believe you went. Oh, my That's gosh. Good. Yeah, I mean, I went to Austin to visit friend and he's like can I go to a fish concert I'm like yeah, yeah. <laughs> one <laughs> thing not? I always do is say yes yeah say yeah that's an improvism is whole, it yeah it's in part of the improv philosophy is saying yes and because if you're in an if we were in an improv scene and I'm like we're on a rocket ship and you're like no we're not we're in a fiat that would kill the scene got it so it's like accepting the reality of the I scene like that. And I think it's true of life, too. When we Ooh. say yes, we have these moments in life where we say yes, and, and something ends up happening. I love that. I think I've always believed that. I let my instinct and spirits guide me to wherever they go, and by saying yes, I am. Mm -hmm. um, I've met the most amazing, interesting people. I mean, Mike, when I was talking to Mike to design the speaker with him for his new house in Vermont, um, he was just an amazing customer because he was super interested in craftsmanship and art and design. He had a ton of choices, and of course he does because he's an artist. And uh, one of the most amazing things, back to the Third Man record, we had just done all these factory tours. And, you know, I never reflect. I'm not a big reflector because I'm always driving forward. Mm. My job is the future, not the past. But I had a huge second. That's, that doesn't really make sense, a huge second. But I had a second. <laughs> Um, of clarity when Jamie, that tall guy who gave the tour, said he takes us through the tour and at the very end we had just taken these same dealers to the tour of our factory which as you know is you know decorated with art and tattooed murals and has rare objects and audio objects and artifacts and things that have heritage of the industry all over us which I'm obsessed with and Jamie goes like this he says and this is what a factory looks like if the factory was designed by an artist and so everybody just looked at me and I'm like what <laughs> and at that moment I realized yeah creative people should be designing what culture will look like and you know this is what I'm programmed to do and so it was just an amazing like moment where everybody it made sense for the people who came to our factory you know because a lot of times you think of business being started by business people who went to business school but really, uh, business is all about creating something. So creatives often start business, and that's why I'm excited to go to uh, the business you created right now. That's right. Well, there's like a human side of it, right? It's like businesses are made up of people, and if they're, yeah. that's why they need to be created by people and not by robots. It's Definitely. Like they need to be like more human, and like how do we think about the people inside of this company versus just like the widgets yeah. and we got to design what that's going to feel and look like and we got to have fun doing it yes because it can't be boring yeah and life is too short life is too fun. short to be boring so let's go eat gelato all right let's do it all right cool winning yeah we really are twinning are we pure twins <laughs> <laughs> we're twins we're twins how you doing <laughs> um and you know i haven't eaten anything today literally actually i, I ate a handful of almond i was actually at the jersey shore what yeah, which Where? Island? on the beach of a little town called margate Nice. Okay. Our grand, our great grandfather used to build houses in Margate. There's yeah. the big giant elephant, Lucy the elephant. Of course, I we yeah. have. So I'm going to tell you guys about a tradition that we have called the point five. This this was our we call it, it was the fifth annual point five. We run a half mile from our house 
to Lucy. <laughs> and it's a half mile run, which is the longest run I do of the year. <laughs> yeah. So we did the fifth annual point five this year and it ends right at the bar next to Lucy, overlooking Lucy, and we do a car bomb. Oh my god, because yeah. you gotta treat yourself and after we, that half mile run. Are you gonna eat any or just hold that Yeah, I'm starving. I just got enveloped with I can't believe you know the town of Margate because I've never met anybody who does. You do go there every year? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that Yeah. Yeah. Dairy free baby. Really? That one is, yeah. Oh my god. I have someone I could bring that to. My wife does not eat dairy. No, Ellen. she she's the last time we talked about it, she's like, Can you make a vanilla sorbet? I was like, one day I will, but we don't currently. I will get oh, points yeah. if I buy that for her. Yeah, then you can go on your road trip. And then maybe I can go on that airstream <laughs> like, and she can, yeah. I think if I did one more trip, I think that I she I'd need a surrogate. A surrogate. A surrogate husband. A surrogate. She got a dog now. Which what made, kind of dog? It's actually a rescue dog. It's a little baby. It's not a baby, it's a five year old shih tzu. Oh, so it's a little dog. It's a little dog, which I didn't expect, but it is black and white, which oh, I like. It matches your matches decor. My own. It doesn't yep. shed. And the dude is awesome. His name is Zach. <laughs> I know, so I'm like, I can't he believe kind it. Of could be a human then. I never had a dog, not once, not ever. Really? So it was the first dog in our house, and I think we got lucky because this guy doesn't say anything. He's just like, and he's got that Chills. underbite. Oh, like yeah, that, the, the Shih Tzu underbite. Yeah, he's got that, and I'm just like, right? He looks at me, I'm like, <laughs> all right, we're good. This is good. So, yeah. So he's kind of a surrogate husband. Yeah, he's a surrogate for me. But he probably doesn't uh, take, he needs he doesn't, more care than he pr doesn't puts shop, out. Doesn't shop, yeah. doesn't come. Doesn't, doesn't want the plants. It's the kids. same thing that you are probably. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to me. Do the kids love it? They love this thing. Aww. It was a good idea. And I, I said no for so long. I was like, we have so much going on. You have so much going on. I have on. so much going on. I'm like, we don't need another thing going on, but it turned out that they were right. Yeah. Maybe they won't notice if they're gone because they have the dog now. It's, it's probably something like that. It's a lot like that. Maybe you just need a second dog and you name it Noah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and make it super frenetic and yeah. insane. And, and, <laughs> and that way your wife has something to yell at. Yeah, like, Noah, and you're like, no, stop. what are you doing? And then she'll Back. feel like you're still there. <laughs> I, I think that would actually help because I didn't realize like she loves to give love and be unconditionally loved. Mm. Me, I also love that. But I also love being out in the world, so mm. you gotta balance those two things. Yeah. How how did you two initially like come together and decide that you wanted to start a family together? Oh, wow, that's deep. That's deep, Mary. Okay. Um, through a series of events, um, a friend actually was like, You gotta meet Noah and another friend was like, You gotta meet Helen and that brought us together. So now that we see each other multiple times and the universe kinda of brought us together. I know I'm being a little flighty by saying the universe. It is one of those things that um, we just had a natural fit there. It felt right? She felt right. She was a year younger, and I was staying in at the university because I got that commission to do artwork here mm -hmm. for the university. So I was like a leftover salmon doing artwork, and she was still studying. So we had that great year where I was done with school, and she wasn't. Uh... And I was just, that's one of the, some of the most insanely productive years, and she was able to hang. Um, so she was doing photography, she would come on the road and we were playing in New York. She, oh, wow. she would help us make our album covers and see oh, yeah. Cool. So it was a long, awesome history. And then we waited a long time because we were young. We got married young. I was 26 or 27, I was 26 when we got married. And we waited, so we had a good, like, solid decade to live hard, which mm. I recommend to all people. Because you met so young then. Met so young. And you know, you change over the decades, but at the core, you know, it's love also evolves. Mm. You know, and things evolve just like your business evolves, um, and you hope to evolve together. Mm -hmm. But then you realize there's other things that evolve alongside you, and those sometimes that can create devolution, and then revolution, and other things that end in evolution. Mm. But, um, I can't think of is that a else. Scrabble word? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's pretty amazing over the decks. Then you have kids, and that changes the game. And then you're yeah. really working for them. And that takes you outside of yourself. Which totally changes the dynamic of the relationship, right? Because all of a sudden it's not the two of you anymore. Now it's you and other humans. Yeah, and as an artist, you're also... I mean, at least I'm never trying to be a static person or a static thinker. So you have to remain flexible. Especially when you have kids. And the biggest thing that time, you know, 20s versus 30s was, okay, the 20s was all about, like, 
literal renegade fast forward just do everything go everywhere be everywhere the 30s was really bad whoa family how do we deal with this kids up all night still trying to push forward mm. make sense of everything um but everyone figured you figure it out throughout whatever happens and there's tons of scares and sick and there's issues but people are stronger than you give them credit for optimism that's right one of my core values so important one. it is like gelato it's like mm. how do you see is it glass like half simple. full uh-huh. hot glass half empty yeah like Have people would like wonder like what's going on here i don't know what to do for <laughs> me i'm seeing it as like kind of a nice thing going a river of chocolate it's kind of a river of chocolate yeah. raspberry now not good if you, have, project. if you have a dairy allergy <laughs> i contaminated your joy yeah <laughs> but if you're me now you have chocolate and raspberry mixed together a beautiful flavor it's just you know like a chocolate covered raspberry and it's amazing yeah it's, it's pretty good this is not a plug, but I will say officially that New Orleans is the damn jam. Best fish gelato we've ever had. Nice. Have people been eating it at the office? Yes, and best gift ever. <laughs> so sometimes Nick will come like on a day. Where on a Friday, because I know that yep. Noah's down to have a few beers. Not always, that he's not always down. I'm there. always down <laughs> to have a few beers. Always down. Especially and, Friday. Especially Friday, but uh, sometimes Fridays, you know, we work hard at Leon and the guys at Leon work incredibly hard. And so, you know, this guy shows up with like it's a block away. A block away with like massive amounts of flavors of gelato. And gelato in, in its essence is just a simple cup of joy mm-hmm. and happiness, right? Mm-hmm. It's an indulgence. And so I love watching the factory guys and girls just go and nice. Chill, eat some gelato while we're drinking beer. Just in So if you have the choice to have the maintain the mind of a thirty year old up until you're ninety. Mm. Or the body oh. of a thirty-year-old up until you're ninety. Wow. What would you choose? Oh man, I'd have to choose body. Body. Why? Because I like I'm an action person. Like I don't like to think too much. I mean, hopefully I would have right mind. Mm-hmm. But I think fitness, fitness is mental fitness. The ability to like just go and do. All right, I'm gonna reverse that and say I'd rather have the mind. Really? Why? If your wisdom, if your mind stays the same as it is when you're 30, then will, will that wisdom evolve? Like your mm. your body's going to evolve, but your wisdom still as it was when I you were 30. This. I like this. See, that's like my my initial response was like, oh yeah, my mind, because like I don't want to be superficial about keeping my 30 year old right. body. But then I thought a little deeper about it, and I thought. I would want to keep my body because I want, I think that as I get older, I learn more and I have yeah, more wisdom and I want, true. I want to be like 80 and have the wisdom of an 80 year old, Yeah, but I want to be able to like go rock climbing. That's like, what I want. Know, that's what I'm with you on. I'm completely real, real live. My first instinct was body because I just like the physicality of life and I like to like crash into it. You don't want to give up on that. But I also um, learned over the years that um, you have to... Uh, let go of some of the vanity side mm-hmm. of things. You know, you, I, I think it, I don't think the same. Some people say like, "Oh, I never changed." I'm the same. So I've definitely changed in a lot of ways because um, I chose to say that. Mm-hmm. Oh, you can't change, it. but that's just what you're saying in your inside internal voice. That's your, the story you're telling. It's the story you're telling yourself, and you know, I never believed in those kind of sentences. Mm-hmm. But then I started telling myself, you know, you can change, and you can change the way you think. And, can let go of certain stories that you told yourself your whole life. Um, but if I lived in about, you're 30, so yeah. it's kind of unfair. I'm 45, so uh, <laughs> I'm deeper in this. I'm deeper in this issue. You, but you're kind of like still a 30 year old. I like, feel exactly. If you like didn't, that. if I didn't know you're 45, like is your energy right? And it's like yeah. that youthful energy yeah. that you can maintain, but you're 15 years wiser than you were yeah. when you were 30. I can tell you as an artist and uh, just as a person that. Uh, thing I didn't have when I was 30 was discipline mm. that I have now. You know, I'm able to just enable the discipline side. Like what changed said, that? Where did you get the discipline from? I don't know, it just happened. I didn't I didn't overthink it. So mm. I just said, I now want discipline. And so every morning I have my routines and rituals. And I think like art, art is like a ritual. Mm. And so my day became a ritual and it helped me just get out of my own way. What's your morning routine like? It's nuts. It's nuts. It's become nuts. It's insane. So it, it's very regimented, and I was 
the most non-regimented person, or I thought I was non-regimented because I told myself that. But that was actually story. it was a story. But what I do now is, you know, I wake up, I do the same, you know, shower, shave, all that stuff. But really, I make sure every day that I do, I do a quick five to seven minute meditation that I created, which is a physical meditation. Some people who look at it might think it looks like. Um, like it's like a whole series of movements and things and stretches and then I do an exercise like by myself, you know, just all body body weights and for fifteen minutes. And then I do an extreme thing, which is a, an extreme test of your physicality. So for instance today I was doing insane things. Like I would have these bars at my house and you do these things like this, you go like this, and you gotta go. Oh wow. Get your heart rate up, shred some fibers. Yeah. And, um, caffeine, robust, best coffee I can find, ground, grind it, make it, and then a simple food, like an almond. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and that's it, and then boom, hang out with the like kids. Picturing you like you got like this whole routine, these complex exercises, and Cutting you get there and there's like almond. a little almond on a plate. <laughs> And sometimes it will just be that. Uh, that. And so yeah, and my son also likes to like do it with me. Uh, what time do you wake up? I wake up at almost every day, almost exactly the same, between 6.30 and 6.45. Okay. So I'm not a super early riser. And I do all those things and then go do the damn job. Yeah. What time Should do you get into Leon? Always, always but I mean, I would go earlier, but I like, that's the time I get to spend with the kids, so usually they click you. Yeah. So I'm not getting in super early anymore. People don't want to see me around. <laughs> But I always stay the latest, so I like to make sure everything ships out the door, the quality is maintained, mm -hmm. things are getting built properly, the designs are getting done. So a hands-on reality. And all your beer is still in the all fridge. All my beer is in the fridge, and then some, and I end the night with with beer. Yeah. Why? Because a recent study showed that if you those people, there was a big study. I think it was like six to seven hundred people. We could look this up and fact check me on the internet, but people who drank coffee in the morning and ended their day with one to two drinks, beer or wine, um, lived 18% longer. Really? I'm going to believe in that science. <laughs> you can find a study that <laughs> Someone find that. Want. Can you find that one? 